you know, for better or worse, this is the cultural landscape, I think, for us as musicians and music educators and professional musicians. We we associate talent with being able to pick up your instrument and play whatever you want to and have it sound good. And in concrete terms, that pretty much means playing by ear and improvisation. And so although those are very specific, trainable, learnable skills, they are also just part and parcel of if I want to feel like I can do anything in music, I'm going to need those skills. And if I want people to look at me the way I want to be looked at as a musician, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to need the skills to just pick up my instrument and play. You are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. Today is no exception. I am your host, as always, Elisa Jansen-Jones, and you can follow my music education blog at professionalmusiceducator.com. Today's episode dovetails nicely with our chat last time about burnout, because today I bring on Christopher Sutton, the founder of Musical You, an online resource for learning musical skills like ear training, jamming with friends, and if you're like me, getting your eyes off the music and just playing for fun. I feel like so many of us graduate college, get our first job, and it's all about triage, right? We grease the squeaky wheels, we put out the fires, we swim like crazy to survive. But when we finally get the routines down and we get into our flow, that's the perfect time to start reminding ourselves of this very important fact. We should never stop learning. But how? We all know about our state, national conferences, and extra ones like collegiate conferences, association conferences, and all of these are great for teaching us teaching skills, but they don't always give us the kind of in-depth personal education to improve our own musicality and thus our own enjoyment of music in general. So what can we do to be better? How do we even get started on improving our own musicality? Don't we already have all the skills that we need? And how can we benefit by improving daily? We answer many of these questions and even more in my chat with Christopher. But first, speaking of professional development, we're starting to ramp up for the 2019 International Music Education Summit. Guys, this is not your typical professional development conference. It's created by music teachers for music teachers, and it's the world's largest 100% online professional development experience for music educators like you, where you can not only attend sessions right from your home computer in your pajamas, but also be able to network with educators around the world, interact with your presenters, including on live, and grab tons of free downloads, tips, tricks, and practical advice for growing your music program. Go to musicedsummit.org and join the email list now. We have some new developments coming for 2019, and you won't want to miss it. Of course, we couldn't do this episode without the support of Smart Music. If you're looking for a fun and interactive ways to get your students to practice, or even just to streamline your own assessments, look no further than Smart Music. Now, let's jump in to my chat with Christopher. Hi, my name is Christopher Sutton. I'm the founder and director of Musical U, and I'm really excited to be on the Music Ed Mentor podcast. Oh, oh, there's more to you than that. <laughs> well, I hope so. But yeah. <laughs> well, one of one of the things that I noticed um, reading about your your background and stuff is you really focused in on tone deaf, like people identifying themselves as tone deaf, and mm. and have kind of gotten into that whole singing training. And I think as music educators, we have to deal with that a lot, right? Kids Mm -hmm. and especially grownups who come in and go, I'm just tone deaf. I'm not a musician. I can't deal with that. So how did you get involved in that to begin with? And where did that passion kind of stem from? Sure. Yeah, I think it's definitely fair to say I have a bit of a a bee in my bonnet around that uh, phrase tone deafness and our cultural assumptions about it. Um, so just to set the context, I grew up learning instruments and I, I was very lucky to get a good music education in the school I was attending. 
So by the time I was a teenager, I was playing four or five different instruments and I had a choral scholarship. So I was singing in the church a few times a week with my school and I was, you know, taking part in musicals and that kind of thing. So singing for me was always kind of a core part of my musical life. And so I guess it might be surprising that I, I would care so much about people who were completely outside that world, but it kind of came out of the, the work I've done over the last decade with my company, Easy Ear Training, uh, now kind of rebranded as Musical U. And in that line of work, I was helping people do things like play by ear and improvise and be creative and confident in music. And more and more, I was noticing that the musicians who were struggling were often also the musicians who would hesitate when I said something like, why don't we just try singing that? Or here's a great little um, exercise you can try humming to get that sound into your head and, and that kind of thing. And it's remarkable, really, when you think about it, the number of musicians and even professional musicians, people at a very high level who will refuse to sing. You know, if, if you say, hey, how does that song go? They'll say, oh, no, I can't sing it for you. I'm tone deaf. And they'll grab their instrument which I think is kind of odd that that is normal in our society. And we kind of separate those two because there are certainly cultures where that would be unthinkable. And I think if you've spent some time in music education on, on the other side of things, you realize how valuable it can be to have even a basic control over your voice and a basic level of confidence expressing musical ideas out loud by singing. And so I kind of was starting to get frustrated that so many people I really thought were on the right track as musicians and were enjoying it and passionate about it were being really held back by this notion that they were tone deaf. And often, I'm sure it's the same in the States, but certainly in the UK, people have a bad early childhood experience with singing. So, you know, often in schools in the UK, there's one occasion where they get all the kids in the year into a room, the teacher plays a note on the piano, says, can you sing that back? And if they can sing it first time, they're in the choir. And if they can't, they're not, <laughs> which is, uh, it, it hurts me just to say it because it's so damaging to those who don't make the cut. And it's such a ridiculous test of whether someone has the potential to be a good singer or not. But that's how it happens. And it means that a lot of people grow up just thinking that they can't sing. And it, I think culturally, we don't have a good understanding of what it means to learn to sing. We kind of think you can do it or you can't, or you're someone who always sings off key, or you're a good singer, or you were blessed with a good voice, or you're just not made for singing in choirs. So anyway, the more I dug into this, the more annoyed I got that <laughs> so many people are locked out of the world of singing and held back in the world of music by this notion of tone deafness. And so in the context of this overall mission to help people with their musicality, I kind of took a tangent for a couple of years and, and got really deep into that topic of tone deafness and helping people to sing in tune. Yeah, I, I think you have made some very astute observations about musicians in general and, and the population in general. I feel like from, at least in the United States, we're kind of pegged to go into instrumental or choral. Like, like that that's your choice. You can't do both. And as instrumental teachers, we tend to focus so much on literacy. I feel like not to say that literacy is the, the opposite of natural singing or, or performing, um, but it, it does kind of, you know, it, it's easy to follow along with the book. And we sometimes forget that that musicality is within us to to begin with, we're all kind of naturally inherently born with it. So fun fact, just started school teaching and starting a middle school choir group for the very first time at my school. I had 14 kids sign up and I was talking to them about some of the things that we can learn and practice in choir, like, of course, learning how to sing, right? And these eighth graders, a couple of them raised their hands and they said, um, yeah, we don't know how to sing. And I said, well, I have wonderful news for you. I know how to teach people to sing. And and you have, I mean, really, we just ignore this innate thing that music is part of our lives from a very young age. And if we can just nurture that and build upon it and embrace it instead of trying to suffuse it with the Western notion of literacy as the ultimate guide to education, Right. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, I love that yeah. that's, that's kind of your mission. So where did you start with, with all of that? Where did you, where did you really get started in the, the technology becoming the facilitator for 
improving musicality? So in the big picture of using tech to improve musicality, it goes back to, I guess, 2009, where I was, at the time I was working as a research and development engineer for a company doing cool stuff with audio and mobile phones. And in that line of work, I got introduced to the idea of ear training. And in that context, it was about hearing different frequency bands. So if you were in the studio tweaking knobs on a mixing desk and that kind of thing, you would have the ear to tell you what you were doing. And it was shocking to me to discover that there was this whole world of ear training for music as well. And, you know, this wouldn't be a surprise to someone like yourself, or I'm sure a lot of the listeners who have trained as music teachers. But for me, despite 15 plus years of being a music student and learning different instruments, no one had really introduced me to this. You know, my only exposure to the idea of your ear being able to do something in music was this painful bit of the exam that no one ever prepared you for, where they played notes on the piano and asked you what the intervals were. And, and that was the limit of my experience of ear training. And so in my 20s, I kind of discovered this whole thing that had been, you know, done for hundreds of years, of course, but a lot of the methods were very stodgy and very, very tied tied to the classical world. And so it was really interesting to dive into that and realize that actually all of that was applicable to pop music and rock music and all of these skills that I'd always kind of dreamed of and been envious of, like improvising or playing by ear suddenly I realized there was actually a method to learn those things. And so that was a, a real uh, aha moment for me and really exciting. And being a geeky guy, and this was around the time the iPhone came out, I got into a hobby project making a little ear training app for the iPhone. And um, around the same time, read a few books in the personal development world that made me think, maybe I should you know, take this a step further and then see if I can make anything of it. So that kind of snowballed from there. And I, I won't tell the, the long and detailed story because uh, as you would know yourself, entrepreneurship is a, a steep learning curve and one for which there are not very, um, there are not guaranteed resources for finding success. So uh, I think it's fair to say until maybe 2014, 2015, it was a very meandering journey. And somewhere in there around 2013, 2014, is where I really took a couple of years and got deep into that tone deafness and singing things specifically. That's that's awesome. What a what a great service. And I know as music teachers, we none of us would claim to be tone deaf, but having a pocket resource like that for people who do, um, a lot of people like myself function outside of the school system as well. So I conduct our community band. I also also often perform in in community choirs and often the desire is there for people but again they hesitate because they feel like they don't have that skill set so talking about skill set we don't graduate from college as music teachers with a complete skill set i don't feel like uh, which is one of my personal missions is to kind of help fill in some of those skills particularly in the the program management bit for music teachers but i feel like musical you um, that you have created really fills another spot for us as well in our musical training. And this really opened my eyes when I went to your website and I did like your little assessment, right? And it was one of the most thorough and enlightening assessments that I've ever taken for myself. Can you tell me about how you develop that assessment and, and how you develop Musical You so that it serves people, even like me, who I consider myself a professional musician and, and educator, but there are still things that I want to learn and you're helping facilitate that. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the thing you're referring to in particular, we call the musicality checklist. And I think you're exactly right that maybe the most interesting thing about it is how it can open your eyes to what's possible. You know, this is a, a simple self-assessment. It takes a few minutes to do. And it came out of the work I'd done for seven or eight years previous in this realm of ear training and then more broadly musicality. And it was really surprising to me, you know, I described a minute ago how it had been an aha moment discovering ear training and that you can do training for this, um, these inner skills of music, even though I'd had a lot of music education, but it took, it, it took several more years before it really sunk in that so many other people were in that same boat. 
and not just the kind of hobbyist, passionate musicians like myself, but we had people coming to our website who were pros, who were, you know, Grammy award-winning artists, even plenty of music teachers too. And, and of course there's a lot of emotional and psychological baggage that comes with all that. You know, I think I, even as a hobbyist felt kind of sheepish that I couldn't improvise or play by ear. And so of course that only goes double if you are professional and people are looking up to you and you feel like, Oh, but I can't even play, you know, twinkle, twinkle by ear. There's something missing. And so that checklist it's designed to inspire you rather than intimidate you. It, it definitely does sometimes go both ways. And we have a little bit at the end that kind of walks you through um, figuring out how you feel about all the boxes you ticked or didn't tick. But in short, it just runs through, I think, 15 or 16 skills in music that you can do or you might want to do. And, and that's how we frame it. We say, I can do this or I want to do this or you're free to not, not tick either box. And, you know, some of these are obvious, I think, like um, playing by ear and improvising. I've mentioned several times because those are big ones that bring people to us. But for us, musicality is much broader than just ear training. And so it's also stuff like having a good sense of rhythm or being able to jam with others in a group. It's stuff like being able to clap in time even, or as we talked about a minute ago, sing in tune. All of these things that I think we assume someone who is naturally good at music would of course be able to do. But actually when you break it down and you accept that, you know, it's not really a matter of talent as much as training, you realize people across the spectrum of musical ability can and can't do these things. And it's always interesting to see how many or how few boxes people tick. You know, it really does run the range. We have a, a very small number who tick every box and may or may not be telling the truth. But I think the reality is almost everyone can come to it and be like, okay, yeah, I can do these things. That's great. I'm, I have some in a musicality already. But actually there are these four or five things that I would love to be able to do. And so hopefully then it's inspiring to them to know that these are all learnable skills. These aren't things you need talent or a gift to be able to do. This is something you can now go on and study up on and train on and be able to do yourself. Well, and you bring up a, a really great um, couple of points there. I often get accused of being talented, right? And and maybe I have a, a little natural ability. Both of my parents are, you know, musicians and stuff. But I always say, you know, it's not talent, it's education. Like, I have trained to be a good singer. I have trained to play all of these instruments really well. I have worked really, really hard to get to the musical point where I am. Yes, sometimes we have some innate ability, but unless we have that passion to be willing to open ourselves up and admit that we can learn more, you know, and that learning more piece is is so fascinating to me because I I'm too, you know, passionate about professional development and encouraging music teachers to continue their their skills but playing by ear and learning how to jam with other people isn't always something that we can immediately turn around and monetize for ourselves right like we we can't show up with a professional development certificate and go look at how much better of a music teacher I am I think sometimes we need to open ourselves up to the fact that we can do something for our own pleasure for our own well-being and it and that's hard when music is our career. Have you discovered that with any of the people that you've worked with that career musicians tend to think, well, if it's, you know, professional, I need to make money off of it. Or do you get what I'm saying? I, I definitely do. And, you know, part of the reason we put this checklist together was to acknowledge the fact that not everyone needs to tick every box. You know, this isn't something where we give you a score and say you are 70% musical, you should try harder. This is something that's really designed to give you kind of your profile as it stands and as you would like it to be, because not every skill is required for every person. And it has been one of the business challenges, but also one of the delights of running this company to see the sheer variety of musicians there are out there, you know, in terms of age, instrument, genre, musical background, musical aspirations. And so at Musical U, one of the tech challenges for us is trying to make a training system that can kind of cover the, all of these skills, but in a way that doesn't impose them all on someone. You know, we're not forcing everyone through a single course and saying, you need to learn all of these skills. Here is how it goes step by step, because everyone is different and not everyone wants to learn those skills. And I totally respect that it may not help your career to be able to jam with others. And yes, it might be nice and yes, you might enjoy it, but it's probably not top priority for you if it's not essential for your work. 
That being said, I think, uh, at least when you joined us on the Musicality podcast, we talked a little bit about um, one of the other aspects there, which is when you're getting off book or you're getting away from the sheet music, that can be really interesting and liberating if you are someone who's been focused on, as you put it before, the literacy, to explore something like playing by ear or improvisation it can transform what you do even when working from sheet music, I think. And we've seen that again and again with people who come into Musical U and, for example, they dabble in our improvisation stuff, even though they don't really want to be up on stage playing a solo in a jazz gig. And they actually find it gives them a totally different relationship to their instrument and to the music they've played before. And so, you know, if I was speaking to you as someone who'd just taken the checklist and said, I didn't tick those boxes because it's not required for my work, I might just gently encourage you to consider that it might add something to your work that you don't anticipate. And that if there are 15 or 16 different elements of musicality, if you're someone who's passionate about music, you probably owe it to yourself to at least explore them a little and see what they might be able to do for you. I remember a couple of years ago, I was visiting some friends. They were, um, we were doing this multiple day hike from hut to hut to hut through the San Juan Mountains here in Colorado. And at one of the huts, our, our friends stopped and we went up to enjoy dinner with them. And we brought, everybody brought their instruments, right? And here are our, our friends and they're totally playing by ear and they're totally jamming together. And here I am, professional musician, and I'm the one who's uncomfortable, right? I'm like, hand me the tambourine. Like I can do the tambourine. Um, but if you had asked me to like pull out my guitar and jam with them, I don't think I could have, at least not comfortably. So for music educators like myself, um, that's my secret for this podcast is really, I just, <laughs> I just ask questions that I really want to know of people. So <laughs> darn, my secret's out now. Um, but why do you think it's important for music teachers specifically to learn how to play by ear more? Where, where does that fit for us? Yeah, I think, I think there's probably two answers to that question. And to put it in context, I am a very geeky guy. I'm a scientist and engineer by background. And when I got into this whole thing, I was thinking very much about skill acquisition and how can we make it easy for people to learn these concrete skills And so one answer to your question, I think, is in that realm of what will it actually do for me literally in my musical life? And I think realistically, the short answer is it will just make you more versatile. You know, there will be situations where you are put on the spot or you do want to play something you don't have the sheet music for, or you need to modify an arrangement and figure out how to make it sound good, even though you're not playing it note by note from the from the written music. But maybe the more interesting answer is what I gradually came to realize in my work and what I have uh, really tried hard to make sense of, which is the whole emotional and psychological side of things. And I'm guessing after you had that trip and you kind of felt a bit sheepish at that jam session, that probably sat with you for a week or two. Like when you thought back on that and maybe even now when you were remembering it, you probably got that feeling in your stomach where you're just like, oh, that wasn't ideal. (laughs) You know, I I would would have quite liked to be able to just whip out my guitar and play. And, you know, for better or worse, this is the cultural landscape, I think, for us as musicians and music educators and professional musicians. We, We associate talent with being able to pick up your instrument and play whatever you want to and have it sound good. And in concrete terms, that pretty much means playing by ear and improvisation. And so although those are very specific, trainable, learnable skills, they are also just part and parcel of, if I want to feel like I can do anything in music, I'm going to need those skills. And if I want people to look at me the way I want to be looked at as a musician, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to need the skills to just pick up my instrument. And And so aside from the kind of, practicality of it and aside from the pure enjoyment of it being able to do those things i think there is that social thing and that psychological thing of making sure that your musical identity is everything you want it to be and fortunately these skills are learnable so even if you felt sheepish in situations like that in the past that is not you like that's not inherently a limitation you have it's just something you haven't learned to do yet Right. It's the whole growth mindset thing that's so big in the Mm. United States right now. So walk me through what happens after we take our assessment for Musical U and we decide that there are these couple of things. What, What are the next steps that we would follow? 
Sure. So if you are becoming a member of Musical U, and just to be clear, we have a, a public website with a ton of free articles and tutorials and resources on every topic under the sun, and you can head to our website and click on the learn button and um, your podcast. to get at that. Don't forget your podcast. Right. Sure. Yeah. So we have a free podcast called the Musicality Podcast, where we had a very special guest recently whose name was Elisa, and you should definitely check out her episode. <laughs> um, so we have a ton of free stuff. So just to, to get that out there, if you take the checklist and you just want to poke around a bit, you certainly can. But our main focus is on developing this comprehensive online training system, which is our members' website. And so for that, you pay a small amount each month to get access to everything. And if you're taking steps into there, what it looks like is we guide you through a short process, but I feel a really important one, which is about thinking just for five minutes about what it is you're actually trying to accomplish. You know, a lot of the ear training apps or courses or um, improvisation or playing by ear material out there, I would say is is limited by the fact that it's very prescriptive. It says, this is what you'll learn, go and learn it. And as we've already talked about, every musician's different in terms of their background and their aspirations and their current skills. And so we really start from the beginning and say, look, imagine yourself five years from now, what would your ideal musical life look like? And we kind of walk you through figuring out in practical terms, what are you aiming for and what are you gonna to need to put in place to get there? So that anything that follows in terms of your training is actually leading towards that, what we call your big picture vision, because otherwise it's far too easy, particularly in the modern age of YouTube and websites to get lost day after day, week after week, feeling like you're learning something, but actually going in circles or going down dead ends or learning things because you feel like you should, even though they're not actually leading towards your musical goals. So we really start there and say, let's make sure that whatever you do, it's leading in the right direction for you. And then we have a set of training plans to get you started. And the actual training system is totally flexible. So it's not that you have to follow that plan, but just to help people find their way around, we provide starter plans for playing by ear, for improvising, for singing in tune, for tightening up your sense of rhythm. And we find that kind of helps people dive in and then they can figure out from there exactly what they want their training to look like. Awesome. Well, I think it's just a fabulous resource that if we really want to improve ourselves as musicians, and why wouldn't we? Because as music teachers, that's what we're doing for our own students. So why would we hesitate to do that ourselves? So my big goal over the next few months is to get better at playing by ear, especially chords on my ukulele. And the, the whole musical you thing has, has completely inspired me. So thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, oh, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. So I want to backtrack just a little bit to your own personal life, if that's okay. So sure. you're you're living in Valencia, Spain right now, mm -hmm. um, and you're originally from London, right? That's right. Yep. Um, so tell me about your world travels. Is this the first time that you've left your native country or have you traveled elsewhere? We've traveled a fair bit. Uh, so I have a, a wife and two young daughters and... One of the benefits of running an online music education company is that I have been very flexible in my work in terms of where I do it from. And so I started the company 2009, I guess 2014 ish. Um, my wife had been working as a doctor in the UK. So up until that point, we were very UK focused. But at that stage, she was making a career change, and that meant we could jump ship to, to somewhere else. So we moved to Ecuador for a year and lived in Quito, up in the mountains, which was lovely. And then in Medellin in Colombia for a few months, then back to the UK for my first daughter to be born. And we stayed there for about six months before a little bit of a tour of Europe, uh, including Valencia, where we're now uh, settling a bit more. And then Mexico for a year, Mexico City. So we just came back from Mexico December 2017, so about six months ago for my second daughter to be born. And now we have just a month ago made the move to Valencia. So yeah, we the last few years have seen a bit of travel. That's that's just amazing. And to delve into the cultural aspects of all of those places, I bet it was just super, super fascinating. Do you find that music is consistent across all of those cultures in some way? It's, of course, universally present. And I think as a music fan, it can be great to just kind of absorb and experience the different instruments and different styles. I, I personally have really enjoyed getting into Spanish pop music, funny as that sounds, but there's like this whole 
world of genres I'd never been exposed to, um, like reggaeton and champeta and all of this kind of salsa rhythm infused pop and dance music. And, you know, I, I'm not a, a massive pop music fan, but when you're, you know, taking taxis or in a restaurant and exposed to this every day, it, I think it's somehow more palatable when it's from a foreign culture than when it's your own um, sugary bubblegum pop. So that's been fun for me just as a music fan. Um, as a music educator, I will confess I have not gone deep into each of these places we've been living. The, the downside of working from your laptop is that even if you're in an exciting culture, you're tending to be working from your laptop. <laughs> so I, I've certainly you know, met people and had conversations about what music education looks like in these places, but I, I can't claim to have really you know, immersed and integrated in, in them just due to the nature of my own work. No, that's that's awesome. Um, you know, listening to Justin Bieber over and over again, finally let it sink in that it really wasn't that bad. <laughs> 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 or maybe it is. And I just have low standards, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Well, such great insights from you today, Chris. So thank you for taking your time to talk to us music teachers. And, and I really think that the lesson for this episode is get uncomfortable if you want to grow, whether that's doing a self-assessment on the Musicality U website or starting to take a class to learn a skill that you maybe just want to enhance for your personal well-being or even experimenting with different lifestyle things so that you can be a more effective person and a happier person and a more effective educator. So thank you so much. Any final final words for for music teachers? No, just to say uh, thank you again for inviting me to be on the show. I'm a, an avid listener myself and I really support the work you're doing. I think it's a fantastic mission. And I, I would be honored if any of your listeners wanted to check out Musical U and explore our free resources there. I'm always particularly excited when a music teacher comes to us because obviously you are the guys on the front lines having the impact on many more students than we ever could individually. So anything we can do to support or guide or inspire is, is fantastic in my book. So yeah, thanks so much for listening to this conversation. It's been a, a great pleasure to talk with you, Elisa. Awesome. Thank you. I hope you gleaned some great information from my chat with Christopher. I want to share a story with you. When I quit my teaching job in my early 20s so I could stay home and raise my little kids and open my own private lesson studio, the first thing I bought with my last paycheck was my guitar. This wasn't a chintzy $100 job, but like a really nice Alvarez. And I did something I hadn't done in years. I started taking lessons. Fast forward a few years and people are asking me, so do you teach guitar? And the answer for a very long, long time was always an emphatic no. Guitar was just for me. It wasn't something that I had ever done until after I had been teaching for several years. So it's just for fun to sing to my kids to sleep or to play around the campfire with my family. If I started to teach guitar, it was going to feel like work. And as you know, one of the great ways to avoid burnout and just have a happier life in general is to be able to separate work from life and from play. And that's what I feel like Christopher has to offer. We professionally trained music educators. It's a great way to enhance our own skills so that we can not just transfer them into our students, but enjoy them ourselves in an engaging and fun way. At the very least, I recommend checking out the Musical You online assessment, where you can discover your own musical strengths and weaknesses. It's super enlightening. I also wanted to let you know that Smart Music has been running some excellent webinars lately, including one by yours truly, all about seven strategies for avoiding burnout. You can discover all of these great workshops on the Smart Music YouTube channel, so be sure to check those out. You can also find out about the live webinars before they happen by following the Smart Music Facebook page as well. Remember to visit musicedsummit.org and sign up to receive all of the exciting updates about the 2019 International Music Education Summit. I promise you won't want to miss it. Huge thanks to all of those of you who have liked, rated, and shared this podcast. By doing so, you're helping us reach even more music educators like you. 
Thank you so much. Until next time, my friends, keep teaching on. Yeah.